Welcome, everyone, to Champagne 4, where we are about to hear from uh, Professor Stephen Hicks. It's a profound honor and privilege uh, to be able to introduce him. He is a professor of philosophy at Rockford University. Uh, he is the uh, author of several books, including Explaining Postmodernism. Um, he is also, very proud to say, a, uh, the, the senior scholar at the Atlas Society. And in, in that role, he is crisscrossing the country for us, uh, speaking at dozens of student conferences um, around the country. And um, also, uh, we are publi publishing several pamphlets by him, um, including most recently, uh, Ayn Rand in Business Ethics. Uh, so Stephen, uh, Stephen's book on postmodernism, uh, Jordan Peterson sa said, if you wanted to understand postmodernism, there's one book to read, and that's uh, Professor Hicks' book, uh, which the Atlas Society has also made available on Audible. So um, we are very honored to have Stephen, and I'm going to let him take it away. All right. Thank you, Jake. In my day job, I'm a professor at a university. It's a liberal arts curriculum, so we have small classes, and that means a lot of one-on-one -on -one and small group discussions with students, so I get to know them very well. I teach in a humanities uh, program, and so I have students from all of the humanities disciplines, and so I get to know how they think philosophically, and of course, as young people, they're engaged with the big questions of life. And one of those questions is, what's the best kind of society? Now, this proposition that socialism does work should seem provocative and counterintuitive to us. Because, at least in my lifetime, uh, the mainstream opinion has been, we tried socialism, we tried it again, we tried it in this variation, we tried it in that variation. And every single time, it didn't work. And not only did it not work, it was a complete disaster. But right. the takeaway is, while socialism does not work, it is a moral ideal. It's a high-minded set of moral principles that just unfortunately cannot be realized in the practical day-to-day -day world. And that position has been argued very effectively to the point where it is a cliché. But it, the way younger people process that then is, is that it puts them in a bind because if they accept that proposition, then the choice they have to make is the following. I can either maintain my ideals and pursue goodness, morality, dignity, whatever I take that to be, but I'm going to have to accept that I'm never going to be practically successful in the world and that I'm never going to actually see my moral ideals come to life in reality. Or what I can do is sell out my ideals, give up on idealism, and say, well, you know, capitalism is kind of dirty and grubby and money-seeking and this, that, and the other thing, but it does work, and that's just life. Deal with it. And that's a profoundly demoralizing choice to have to make. But there is a cultural land shift that's been going on uh, in the last, I would say, eight or nine years or so. And it's an another generation of students who are not really uh, historically informed. They don't know about the Soviet Union and communist China and Cambodia and the long list of failures and so forth. And they're just not convinced that socialism does not work. They're convinced that socialism is good. I've got some data, scary data, certainly. I'm going to show you shortly right about this. But they are convinced that socialism is moral, and they do believe that socialism does work. And I want to argue that, in fact, socialism does work. Right? But we have to be careful in how we use our terms. This is not a Bill Clinton, you know, what does the meaning of is, right, is, right? What does work mean? Well, work means something, a principle, a pattern, a tool is effective at getting you toward your goals, your dreams, your ideals, right, whatever they are. But what that means is you have to define what your goals, values, and ideals are to judge whether something or other works or not. 
And when you define those values, what we find is that those of us who are in the freedom movement, what we take to be our top goals and values are quite different from the ones that are on the other sides of the debate. And so we'll have different values and therefore a very different understanding of what does or does not work. So <clears throat> let me uh, show you some bad news. There's bad news and there's good news. This is from yesterday. This is a, a philosophical publication. Uh, I have the source here if anybody wants it. But what they did was they went to undergraduate majors and they asked them their views on socialism. So they're trying to take a snapshot of contemporary culture. And you had one question which was about socialism and you were given four options. I am <clears throat> very favorable towards socialism, somewhat favorable towards socialism, somewhat unfavorable or very unfavorable. And we have philosophy, anthropology, English, international relations, blah, 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 economics, finance, accounting all the way down. And these are the distributions. I know this print is small, but I will, so I'll read it out. And I'll just focus on philosophy, my home discipline, because uh, it's the worst. 39% have a very favorable view of socialism. And I don't know if you know anything about philosophy majors, uh, but they tend to be quite smart and self-confident. They don't mind big questions and arguing both in all sorts of issues and so on. Then another 39% have a somewhat favorable view of socialism. So put the two 39s together and round, you've got 80% of this generation's undergraduate philosophy majors have either a somewhat or very favorable view of socialism. And that's the reality of the market that many of us are trying to reach. Now, there is a little bit of good news here. <clears throat> uh, if you look at the economics numbers, right, only 8%, 18%, uh, and then 44% have a rather unfavorable view of socialism. So that does indicate that then if we can get students to take some economics courses, those economics courses that do focus on the practicality of markets and trade and so forth can have an impact on open-minded younger students and changing their views right, and so forth. But of course, how many students take an undergraduate economics course? How many actually understand more than a C level, right, and so forth? And the more important thing for me is that the vast number of students in English and history and all of the traditional humanities disciplines, most of them will not take an economics course. They will nonetheless come to have very firm views on politics and the just society without knowing anything significant about economics. And there's a very interesting question there, why they think, as they do, that they can have very firm views on what the proper political society should be, including how the economy should be organized without ever studying economics. And that then is to say that they have another trump card, right, or another way of framing the issues about how we should think about politics and economics that doesn't really turn on economic knowledge or something that's more important to them. And what that more important thing is, is a philosophy of life, a meaning of life with a set of values, a set of ideals. And you get those, you make a commitment to those, and everything else is to filter into that. So we have done a really good job in the liberty movement over the last century, right? arguing the economic case, arguing the political governance case, coming up with lots of historical examples. And we can bemoan the lack of history education, the lack of civics education, the lack of economics education, and so forth. Right. But there is a moral message that is getting out very effectively to people. Now, from my perspective, it's an immoral message. It's a wrong view of morality. But it is the minority view, the one that I hold. And I think most of us uh, implicitly or explicitly in this room right, will hold. We're dealing with a different understanding of what the good life should be all about. Now, that's the bad news. All right, the good news, though, is when I talk with young students, and I talk about freedom versus authoritarianism and so on, money and economic issues is a part of it. But we're not just interested in a free market. We're also interested in free inquiry in the sciences. We're interested in freedom of religion. We're interested in freedom in our love lives, in our romance lives, and so forth. Right? We want a free life in all areas. And when we talk with students, what I find fairly consistently is the vast majority of students are on our side. They're basically libertarian 
on almost every issue out there except for anything that has to do with money, economics, and business. And that's interesting. So if you were to take all of the standard arguments about why we need to have government regulation or total government control of the economy and applied them to sex, and you ran those by young people, and you say, OK, so what we need to do is have right, that the government decide how many children are going to be produced each year, right, quality standards, right, who gets to have sex with whom, Right, to regulate the dating market. After all, there's a lot of lying that goes on in the advertising, right, and so forth, uh, and ensure quality control, right, and so forth. Every single student, right, in the United States is going to be horrified by that and say that is repulsive, ugly, disgusting. Get out of my love life. Get out of my dating life. Get out of my bedroom life. Right? So they're entirely libertarian on that. Anybody should be able to date anybody they want and have sex with whomever they want. It's a very libertarian culture on that movement. If we were to do the same thing about religion, should we have state-enforced views on religion, the government deciding what's allowed and what's not allowed, right? the size of churches, the, the layout of the altar, and this, that, and the other? No, 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 sorry. Right? Mandating church attendance or synagogue attendance or what? No, no, no. Right? People should be free to believe whatever they want and do whatever they want and the young people right, buy into that. Same thing with respect to their artistic preferences. As consumers, artists should be able to make and do whatever they want. People should be able to buy, consume, trade, whatever art, movies, literature, and so forth they want. Totally libertarian on all of those things. So we have won the debates in all of those areas. But there's something very weird that happens as soon as we start talking about dollars, money, business, economics, then, as we know, a significant number of them buy into all of the anti-liberal, anti-libertarian arguments. And why that is, that's very interesting. Now, this is what we do really good, or really well. This is a good graphic. It's pulled from the Gapminder site. I highly recommend it. This is a Swedish organization based in Switzerland. You can make your own charts. It's a very user-friendly thing. You can map anything that you want. Well, this is the way we like to argue, uh, and that is to say, let's say what really matters is that being rich is better than being poor. So let's plot all of the countries in the world along the axis from the poorest countries down here to the richest countries over here. Each circle here represents a different country. Big circle, big population, small circle, small population. And they're also color-coded by region. So that yellowish is uh, European countries. The Americas are in green, Asia in red, blues in Africa, and so on. And we're also interested in uh, life expectancy and health. So here we have life expectancy at birth. So the lowest countries, 50 years of life expectancy at birth, and it goes on up into the 80s. So we do a lot of data gathering and number crunching and statistical analysis, and we use the best softwares to make really pretty graphs and so forth. And we then say, look, right, the case for freedom is really good, and it is really good, because we think what's really good is being rich and living a long time right, in the material world, and then what we find is that all of the countries that are up there, those are the people who are the richest in the world, who live the longest time, and by all comparative measures, they are the freest, the most hospitable to free markets, trade, business, profit-seeking, achievement, and so on. So we've got great data. <clears throat> and then we like to do all sorts of comparisons. We, uh, if we're old enough, right, we will say things like, well, compare Eastern Europe with Western Europe. Right? It's a slam dunk. Right? Or compare North Korea with South Korea. And we show the satellite images. Right? The data is strong there. Or we say things like, well, look at Cubans in Cuba and compare com Cubans in Miami, right? So it's the same group of ethnic people, but one is in the United States, one is in Cuba, and it's night and day differences. So we've got economic data as much as we want, and it's all compelling in favor of the, uh, the values that we want. Now, my favorite example currently for the last year or so has been to compare on this one Botswana and Zimbabwe, uh, because we have really good data on the African nations now, and the African nations have been the most resistant to progress over the course of the 20th century, although there is a lot of good news now coming out of, out of Africa. But uh, this is another perfectly, it's almost like a perfect social science study right, comparing these two countries because you have two uh, 
uh, uh, places where geographically they're relatively the same. Right? Lots of desert, some forest area, some water, and so forth. Actually, Zimbabwe is a lot better off. Much of uh, Botswana is the Kalahari Desert, so in terms of natural resources, Zimbabwe is better off. But these are people with the same mix of ethnicities, religions, history going back centuries and millennia and so forth. It's basically everything the same except, <clears throat> actually one other thing they had was the same was, they were both former colonies that broke away and became independent at about the same time. And they made very different decisions. Right? At that point, <clears throat> the Botswanans said, we're kicking the British out. And the British were kind of pussycats at that point, so they left relatively peacefully. And the Botswanans then said, now that we are independent, basically we're going to keep doing things the British way. We're going to maintain the British common law, the British parliamentary system, the British cultural institutions, the British, uh, 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 and so forth and so forth. And the Zimbabweans made a very different decision. Instead of doing things the British way, now that we are independent, we're going to do them um, the German way. And so what they did was they imported Marxism and they had a Marxist socialist right, revolution there and changed their culture in that direction. So perfect social science experiment. We fast forward the data. We go back to this chart. This is Zimbabwe. You can see my, my, my additions, my art skills right, coming to bear here. And that is Botswana. So there's a difference of life expectancy. This number is 60. Right? This number is 68. Eight years life expectancy difference between the two. That has emerged over the course of one generation. And the income difference is much more significant. This is actually a logarithmic scale. Each unit of space doubles the amount of income. So the average Zimbabwean is living on less than $2,000 per year. The average Botswanan is about $17,000 per person per year. So same people, same history, same everything, one difference, freedom or not, basically, and one country is eight and a half times as rich as well. So we love the data. We love the argumentations. And our value framework then says it should be a slam dunk. Don't do socialism. Right? Do some sort of a free society. The data are out there, but they don't make a dent in the thinking of people on the other side. And it's not just that people who are on the other side aren't aware of the data. Even when you start trotting out the data to them, they will say that doesn't really matter. And why it doesn't matter to them is because they have a value framework, and that's what we need to look at. So <clears throat> I want to think about this value framework. So we look at this and say, well, you know, we have some very entrepreneurial cultures up here, so we should be celebrating entrepreneurship and markets. But that's a value judgment, right? So a couple of anecdotes from very recent experience. A few years ago, uh, Apple Computer had something like 85 billion, I think the dollar amount was, of revenue that was profit to them, but they had parked it offshore. And they weren't going to bring it back to the United States because of a huge tax liability they would incur if they repatriated it. There was some press discussion of that. But in my classes, right, when I would raise this journalistic example, I would have a persistent number of students who were outraged at Apple for not bringing the money back to the United States and paying their tax burden. And when we talked about this, right, the argument was something like, not necessarily super articulated, but Apple is an American company, and so it belongs to us. And so anything that Apple earns, we Americans should get a share of it. So there's a kind of notion, uh, it's not necessarily nationalistic, but it certainly is a collectivistic notion that what is produced by all of the companies belongs to all of us, and Apple is not fulfilling its appropriate duty, social responsibility as a business, by trying to keep its money away from the people to whom at least some significant share of it are properly owned. So the ethic that says, you know, Apple earned this money and the, uh, the money belongs to its shareholders and they should be able to keep a lot of it, that ethic is alien to a significant number of students. Another anecdote, right? Bill, Bill Gates, I see again the richest man in the world after Jeff Bezos's divorce. Yeah, I'm not sure, right, but 
go-to example everybody has heard of Bill Gates. And I will ask them the pointed question, do you admire Bill Gates? And most of them will say yes, some will say yes enthusiastically, some a little less so. Uh, why do you admire Bill Gates? And if you ask the story, look, Bill Gates took a very small software country, company and built it up, and he made Microsoft, along, of course, with a lot of other people. But in terms of our best assessment of the value that he added, he's adding 60, 70, 80 billion dollars right, to the economy. That's what we want to reward. Do we admire Bill Gates for being this awesome entrepreneur and businessman? And the reaction that we typically get is cool respect. That's good. That's nice. But then we point out that Bill Gates has been giving away many millions and billions of his dollars. And if we ask people, why do you admire Bill Gates, and they're willing to say yes, they're much more likely to say it's because he's giving so much of his money away to other people. And that's an ethical value judgment. What is most important when we're appraising ourselves and other people, their abilities as makers, the creators of value? Or is it morally more noble to give your money away? And my experience with uh, younger students is cool respect for the makers, sometimes disdain, but enthusiasm to the extent that people give away their wealth. There's a different ethic in place. Another example, this goes back a little further, Malcolm Forbes was, uh, strikes strongly in my memory. He reached one of his milestone birthdays, and he you know, a multimillionaire or whatever he was, and he decided he was going to throw a huge bash. And so I think what he did was he rented this entire resort in Morocco somewhere in the, uh, in the foothills of the Atlas Mountain, close to the Sahara Desert. And at his own expense, he flew in you know, five or 600 close friends from all over the world. Everything is first class. And basically, they just had a big party in the Moroccan desert for a week. And the bill was in the, the millions, of, millions of dollars. And so this gets reported in the news. I bring in the news clipping. I put it on the, uh, on the, the PowerPoint. And I asked students for their reaction. And the reaction, of, again, of a significant minority of them who are vocal is to say, that's really disgusting. That's really kind of repulsive. Because right? you think this guy, he's rich, he's old, right? he's got all of this money, but what is he spending it on? He's spending it to celebrate himself. He's spending it on me. Right? And then they will point out, wouldn't it be better right, if those millions of dollars had gone to people who really needed those dollars? And so he should not be spending it on himself. He should be spending it on other people. And what that then means is if we, from our value framework, are celebrating individuals who, like Malcolm Forbes, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, can go out and do awesome things, and a system that enables them to do so, because we have a certain value framework, but that makes not a dent in others. It's because they have a very different value framework. We celebrate making, they're celebrating giving away. We're celebrating ourselves right, uh, and, and hoping to enjoy the fruits of our labors. We're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to give away. We see the assets that individuals and companies create as belonging to them as individuals. The others are seeing them as a kind of collective asset that can and should properly be redistributed. That moral collision is our biggest obstacle. It's not the data. It's not the empirics. It's not the logic. We've got that on our side. We don't have good marketing on the ethics. So I uh, like a lot of John Stuart Mill. He, uh, <clears throat> on one point, uh, has perhaps the strongest case for intellectual freedom. And the argument that he makes is, if you want to be successful in your life and, of course, in advocacy, you have to know what you stand for and why. But you also have to know what your adversaries stand for and why. And in fact, you have to know better what they stand for and why, because you also have to be able to point out what's wrong with what they stand for and how your position is better. So spending a lot of time thinking about our rivals and our outright enemies and getting inside their heads. That's what I spend a lot of time doing. So come back to this theme about socialism working. Something works if it gets you where you want to go. 
But defining where you want to go, your goals, your values, and ideals, that's where we need to think about. So think, for example, of these people. <clears throat> They're living communistically. All properties, to some extent, all uh, sexual partners, children raised in common. A lot of short-lived communes out there, but there are a certain number of long-lived communes now pushing 50 years. This one in Tennessee, this one in California. It works. They believe in a simple lifestyle, back to nature, technology, big business, and so forth is a kind of moral corruption. And not only that, it's ruining the environment and despoiling everything. So from their value framework, small-scale communistic living works, and they've got some successful experiments running by their own lights. Other examples, even longer lived. These are uh, a picture of some Hutterites women and young girls from Western Canada. They're part of, uh, <clears throat> kind of a school of religious fundamentalism, closely related to the Amish and the Mennonites, but they do everything communistically. All of the property is owned, the farms. The women do all of the cooking together communally. Everybody eats together communally. Men raise the barns together communally. All of the animals are owned communally. It's a totally communistic society, and it works. If your goal is to keep a distance from the bad, dangerous, morally corrupt outside world, and to live a life of religious purity. Or if we're interested in longevity, the long histories of monasteries, both in the Eastern traditions and in the Western traditions, where your top values are poverty, chastity, obedience, and you live in an organizational structure with very firm rules, and it's what we would call socialism. No private property, communal sleeping halls, everyone dressing the same, and so on. So we can't say that those don't work. What we can say is they do work if those are your goals. There's another goal. What if you're a power luster? You want power over people. Well, there are a lot of socialists right, who are really authoritarians in disguise, but they recognize that socialism is very useful as a populistic or, or, or a political tool for getting, I'm sorry? It fell off, okay, thank you for that. Technical repair. Good, back? All right, thanks. So suppose your top value is to control other people, to get them to do what you want. Well then of course any sort of social system that says basically all of the property and resources and including all of the human capital should be at the control of the government and you think you've got a very good chance of rising up in the government, then you will get as much power in this ideology works very well to get you where you want to go. So let me give you an unusually explicit example of this, Otto von Bismarck, this is from 1883, the first modern welfare state in Europe. The state should assist its needy citizens to a greater degree than before. It's not only a Christian and humanitarian duty, of which the state apparatus should be fully conscious. I know this is death by PowerPoint, but this is an important part of our history. It is also the task to be undertaken for the preservation of the state itself. The state needs clients. And the way it can get clients is by manufacturing them. The goal of this task, that is to say, the creation of a welfare state, is to nurture among the unproperty classes of the population, which are the most numerous as well as the least informed, right, there's a lot of them and they're kind of stupid, the view that the state is not only a necessary but also a beneficent institution. Now, there's a long history of politicians right, who will pretend to be politicians and sprinkle goodies among the people, knowing that the people will then support them, but what they then really want is the power to use the government for whatever purposes they want. Bismarck is merely a clearer example right, of someone saying explicitly that's part of what our goal is. So he wants power, and he knows that he's going to be the one to wield the power, but at the same time, he's saying it's a Christian and a humanitarian duty. So it works, and it's moral. It's not that we have to make a choice between what's moral and what works. There's a union. But of course, 
what works and what's moral from this perspective is very different from the moral perspective, I think, of most of us in this room. That's the battle we have to fight. So what we then say is, well, <clears throat> You know, if your top goals are to live the simple life or to live a purely spiritual life or to have as much power as you possibly can, socialism is and can be an extraordinarily attractive and workable political system for you. And that means what we need to be able to do is offer different values and make a better case for different values. Now I want to bring things up to speed. AOC, I know she's a common a whipping girl for many people in this room. But I propose that we think of her the way John Stuart Mill would like us to think of her, as to say, take her seriously. Maybe she's uninformed and goofy on all sorts of things, but she is a thoughtful person, and in my view, she does have convictions. So I've read some of her stuff. And here, she's quite clear. What does socialism mean? Socialism means is to guarantee a basic level of dignity. Now think of the moral concepts that she's appealing to. What she is saying is dignity is and should be a top value. And she's making a claim about that. Every human being should have a baseline dignity given to them. Do we disagree with that? But then, where does dignity come from? And now we have to get all philosophical, right? Is something that is a, an inherent birthright? Is it something that has to be earned? And if it has to be earned, what are the steps that are necessary to acquire a genuine dignity? And then, of course, we have this other important word here, guarantee. There should be guarantees in life. Now that's to say she has a value framework and a value assessment about risk. This is a risk-averse person. That on certain things in life, there should be no risk involved. Now, those of us who are on the freedom side of the fence, we say, well, no, what are you talking about? Life is all about risk and risk management. And then particularly, if you're an entrepreneurial person, it's about risk tolerance and risk embracing. So what we then have is, we think dignity has to be earned. She thinks dignity should be a baseline that is guaranteed. We think risk is something to be embraced and at least tolerated. And she is arguing that risk is something that should be taken out of the equation and that there should be guarantees. And unless we engage with her on that two-dimensional value debate, we're never going to convince her out of socialism and into free markets. Now, she's only a politician. I say that with academic snobbishness. <laughs> but here's a professor, and this is interesting. Professor Michael Harrington was perhaps one of two most famous American socialists, academic socialists, uh, in the generation when I was coming up. This is from a publication of his in 1988. I think the intellectual lineage is interesting because AOC was born in 1989, I understand. So this is Professor Harrington's most prominent uh, academic socialist in America at the time. This is his legacy to her. But notice what he says here. The basic necessities of life, food, shelter, clothing, education, medical care, are met in my utopia. I don't care if they, that is to say the recipients, are lazy, promiscuous, irreverent, rotten people. No one should have to go hungry or cold, scoundrel or not. Unconditional that you should be looked after. And I wouldn't change a single facet of human nature as we know it. Now that's a strong moral claim. It's the exact same claim that AOC is operationalizing in the next generation. Security, dignity, and self-respect. That's what socialism means to them. And those are values. Corruption. The sign says here, capitalism is corruption. This is a guy right, protesting. Many young people, of course, uh, this is starting to become a cliche among us. They'll say, yeah, they're in favor of socialism, but do they know what socialism means? Is it really that they're envisaging some 
idealistic socialistic future and just longing for it, or is it more a matter that what they do is they look at the current system with all of the cheating and handouts and bailouts and back scratching and cronies and power lusting politicians and lying CEOs, and they're repulsed by it. They see the obvious unfairness, injustice, illegitimacy of a huge amount that goes on. But of course, we are trumpeting the system as the American way, free markets and capitalism. Well, if that's what free markets and capitalism lead to or are, with all of its obvious injustice, I'm opposed to that. And if socialism is the alternative to that, that's what I'm in favor of. But we'll notice that again is a moral argument. Corruption is repulsive. Humans should strive for justice. Free markets and capitalism, in their view, are not delivering the goods. So I don't care how many goodies and trinkets capitalism can generate for us. I want a decent, fair, moral system. And that has to be socialism. The themes, power, corruption. And those are important themes. All right. <clears throat> Another kind of traction to socialism, uh, how many of you have heard of Marilyn Vos Savannah? I believe she's now retired. So she was the woman who scored highest, actually the human who scored highest ever on standardized IQ tests, right, you know, off the charts, genius. And so she had a column in Parade Magazine where people would send in brain puzzles and she would Say, here's the brain puzzle, she'd write it up, think about it for a week, and in my next week's column, I'll come back and give you the answer. So it's kind of fun for nerds right, and people who like uh, brain puzzles and so forth. But the one that's stuck in my mind, it's the one that <clears throat> resonates with my students because I use it in my classes. And the students who are the socialist students like this. So here's the anecdote. There was a reader who wrote into Mar Marilyn Vos Savant, they said, there was a husband who was writing in saying he and his wife and his brother-in-law had been sitting around the dinner table having a big argument about a math problem and they couldn't figure out or get each other to agree what the right answer to this math problem was. So they're writing a letter to her, world smart person, please give us the answer to this math problem. So here's the math problem. They have a box of 100% brand cereal sitting on the table. And from that box, you pour one cup exactly of 100% bran cereal into a bowl. They also had on the table, apparently this was a real bran family, a, a box of 40% bran cereal. And so you take the 40% bran cereal and you also pour exactly one cup into the bowl. So you now have a bowl with two cups, one with 100% bran, one with 40% bran. And here's the math question. What percentage of bran is now in the bowl? The husband had said, we had three different answers to this. He said, of course, mine is the right answer. We have a wager on this, but we would like you to sanctify the right answer so we know who gets to win. So he goes on to then say, my wife thinks that the correct answer is that the bowl has 140% bran. So reading between the lines, her way of thinking is the way you solve percentage averages is by adding. Okay. And the guy goes, well, obviously that's wrong. Right? And he says, my brother-in-law, he thinks the right answer is 60%. You can't have 140%. Come on. It's 60%. So what you do is you take the 100% and you subtract the 40% from the 100% and you get 60. And of course, that's also wrong. Okay. And then he says somewhat Smugly, the right answer is that it depends. This is the husband writing, do you pour the 100% bran in first or the 40% bran in first? Okay. okay. And of course, that's wrong. But the point is, these people vote. Okay. And there's three of them for every one of you. Yeah. OK, so what does this imply for the proper organization of political economy? Can these people function 
freely and self-responsibly in this complicated, high-tech, scientific world that we have created? No, they're going to be babes in the woods. They're going to be taken advantage of. So what we need is going to be people like my students, or perhaps people like us, who know that we are smarter than the average person. We have the education. So the point then is that we need a socialism. But this is not a just guaranteeing basic income to everybody. This is not a power-lusting kind of socialism. This is a socialism that driven, is driven by two things, a genuine benevolence. We want to help people who we think are basically incompetent in life, and the view that intelligence is dramatically unequally distributed in society. Now, those two value judgments are not ridiculous value judgments to make, and those are the ones that we need also to be attending to. Ah, myth of Gyges. Uh, you may have read Plato in your introduction to philosophy class, but there's another version of this story in Herodotus. And this is another story that brings out a certain kind of socialist in class. <clears throat> Gyges was a poor shepherd boy, and the uh, legend has it that he was looking after this village's sheep. So he's got this very lonely, boring job up in the mountains looking after the sheep all summer. Uh, his love life is nowhere because he basically doesn't have a chance to hang out with women. When he's back in the town, he doesn't really have very much money and he smells like a sheep, so <laughs> he's not going to be very successful. So he's not in a very good situation. But the legend has it that he's poking around in some rocks and he finds a ring. And it's a gold ring and it's got this big jewel in it. And uh, so he puts it on, he's playing around with it, and finds out that when he takes the ring and turns it so that the stone is facing inwards, he becomes invisible. And when he turns the stone outwards again, he becomes visible again. All right, so what Plato wants us to do is then to say, what happens next in Guy Jesus' life? And so we're supposed to pause dramatically and then you know, say, imagine that you had this ring that would make you invisible any time you wanted to be invisible. What would you do? Right? And then we start to think, okay, well, what do I really want? And how can the ring help me get what I really want? And, and lots of scenarios start to spring to mind. And so then when we go on to tell the rest of the story of Gyges, that what he did first was abandon the sheep, he went back to the village, and that in the village a crime wave began. Right? Stuff got stolen, women got raped, people mysteriously ended up killed. Right? So there had been all those people who picked on him. He was able then to satisfy the desires that every human being has. What do we want? We want stuff. We want sex. We want revenge against people who piss us off a lot. And with the ring, we have the perfect freedom to do whatever we want. Now, maybe some of us would say, well, I wouldn't use the ring that way because I'm a decent moral person. But how many people would act exactly the way Gyges did? And the legend has it that he basically uh, stole and killed his way all the way up to the top, killed the king's wife, or killed the king, rather, married the king's wife, and then became a dictator. And the ring gave him the power to do so. So power and Lots of power gives you lots of freedom. But what are you freedom people talking about? We want to empower people, give them lots of power and lots of freedom to do whatever they want in their lives. But doesn't that sound like we're just going to be unleashing a whole lot of Gyges types people in the world? It's going to be chaos. It's going to be conflict. And it's going to be dog eat dog in the worst possible sense. And the few at the top will ruthlessly crawl their way to the top. That's what a freedom-empowered society is going to generate. We can't have that. That's immoral. And so once again, freedom seems like a non-starter because we have a certain value understanding of what people want. They want sex, stuff, revenge, and freedom and power and wealth is just going to enable that. So we need to have controls. And that's going to be a more authoritarian kind of socialism in terms of what's good for everyone. And that's going to be attractive to a certain number of people, and it is. So the point then is, <clears throat> if we really are interested in um, uh, morality, 
and we want what's best for people. Well, people often need to be protected from themselves because too much freedom just means that they're not going to be able to exercise the self-responsibility uh, and we're going to have too much of a chaotic society. All right, one more kind of argument. <clears throat> this is a young woman. This is a, uh, I, not, I just ripped this off her Facebook. Right? It's a young woman, university student. She'd gone over to Africa to do some uh, good deeds and was posting pictures of herself with the loving children who were appreciative of all of the good deeds that they were doing. When you read through the posts, right, uh, she's exemplar of a significant number of students whose attraction to socialism is a kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, moral repentance. Right? That it comes from a place of guilt. And what they are often is students who recognize at some level that they have had a very good, easy life. They came from the United States, or they were born in Canada, like I was. And that was not something that they earned or something that they deserved. It was just a matter of chance that they happened to be born in extraordinarily privileged circumstances, and they don't deserve it. And how do you feel when you realize that you are the beneficiary of something that you do not deserve? Right? Well, there's a moral choice that you have to make, and this is something that needs to be processed. And then, as you become a more worldly aware person, you realize, you make that spring break trip to Mexico, how awful things are in other parts of the world. And of course, Mexico is not that bad. Poverty and sanitation and low life expectancies across the world. So, there but for the grace of God could be me, I just happen to be lucky. I don't deserve all of these awesome things that I have. Those poor people over there, they don't deserve to be in the circumstances that they are. I feel a certain measure of guilt. How can I get this out of my system? And so my devoting myself to solving their problems for them, rediverting large amounts of wealth is then an attractive method for doing so. And what does socialism prom promise? Radical disparities of wealth and redistribution, that's got to be the moral ideal. And it's not that these people want to be running the show. It's not that they believe that people have sinful desires that they will unleash on others. It's driven by a certain understanding of justice and a certain understanding of guilt that comes from that. So here we have two more right, moral themes. Now. If you put that on the list, and you know, the nerd in me wants to make a table, but I resisted that urge. Right. I gave you a total of 10 moral concepts and socialist kind of arguments attached to those moral concepts. Those are the ones that are, in fact, convincing large numbers of young people to advocate various kinds of socialism. On the other side of the debate, when we make our arguments, we also appeal to values and ideals but very different values and ideals. You know, respecting individual freedom as a baseline, as a fundamental. The pursuit of happiness. Right? Maybe we think not everybody can be happy, but policies that will enable the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Sure, capitalism is a system of winners and losers. Not everybody is going to win, but by and large, most people are going to make a go of it. Prosperity, right? not poverty helping the poor, increasing tolerance, increasing racial and sexual equality. And we make arguments that really it's only has been the liberal free market societies in the world that have made significant measures at achieving any measurable racial equality and sexual equality. Achieving peace, the uh, capitalist peace thesis. You know, when was the last time Canada and the United States went to war, for example? or the French and the British, well, it's now been a couple of hundred years, right? because when countries become free market capitalists, they want to trade with each other, and war disrupts the trading network, so you have built incentives not to engage in those things and so on. But the point is, except for equality, and of course that's a hugely contended one, uh, most of these are not the ones on the socialist list. And what we then need to do is track their values, track our values, find where the sticking points is, 
and not to understand or go into the arguments with the, with the assumption that we often do that people who are strongly committed to socialism are depraved on some moral dimension or other, or ignorant. So of course, some of them are depraved, some of them are ignorant, right? but in many cases, they are coming to it from what we would take to be genuine values that they've over-prioritized or misinterpreted, but it's those moral arguments that we have to make. Now, I'm here speaking as Atlas Society representative. This is the heart and soul of our strategy. Right? We're interested in freedom in the free society for individuals, the moral case for free markets, capitalism, and more broadly speaking, that's the one. Socialists will often, the more honest, the more informed ones, recognize the economic data against us. We can talk the history and they will acknowledge the history. We can talk about the political government, separations of power, and so forth, but they're willing to override all of those because they have moral principles that they think are at stake. That's what they're fighting for. They're willing to pay huge economic and freedom costs to achieve those moral principles. That's what we need to challenge, and we need to make compelling, more compelling on the other side, the right to freedom, right, the pursuit of happiness. Young people are receptive to that. This line from Rand is at the Epcot Center. It's from the Fountainhead. By this point, right, throughout the centuries, there were men who took first steps down new roads armed with nothing but their own vision. Students can put themselves in that position because that's where they are. They're at the beginnings of their life and they want to go off and have their own lives and their own adventures and they want it to be their own. What we need to do is give them a better moral vision, better moral arguments so that they can internalize that and go off and live their dreams. I'll stop for there. Whatever amount of time we have left. None? Okay. I'm around uh, for follow-up questions. Uh, thank you for your attention.